Hello, everyone, and welcome to another lecture in my cardiology series. The topic is pericardial disease. My objectives for this lecture are for you to be able to understand the structure of the normal pericardium and to understand the pathophysiology, diagnosis, and management of the following pericardial diseases, pericarditis, constrictive pericarditis, pericardial effusions, and cardiac tamponade. Starting with the structure of the pericardium, uh, the pericardium is essentially a connective tissue structure containing the following components, a outer fibrous layer fused to the parietal pericardium, a cavity that's normally filled with a thin layer of fluid, and an inner visceral pericardium that's fused with the epicardium, the outer layer of the heart. The function of the pericardium is to protect the heart from infections and external trauma and also to help lubricate the walls of the heart. Fortunately, it can be safely removed with a very little detrimental effect on the heart itself. Here's a diagram showing the different components of the pericardium. Uh, here is the very fibrous outer layer. It's fused with the uh, serous component of the pericardium, which has a parietal layer and an inner visceral layer. Uh, between those two layers is a thin layer of fluid um, called the pericardial fluid. And the visceral layer is essentially inseparable from the epicardium. Moving along to the most common pericardial disease, uh, pericarditis. It is a condition characterized by inflammation of the pericardium and it can be due to any number of processes, including infections, uh, which can be viral infections, including Coxsackie viruses, echoviruses, uh, HIV and CMV, tuberculosis, and fungal infections. Malignancies of all kinds can also cause pericarditis. Rheumatologic diseases, such as lupus and rheumatic fever, uremia as a result of severe renal dysfunction, radiation, surgeries, uh, particularly previous cardiothoracic surgeries, and also in the period following a myocardial infarction. Uh, these in occur in two phases. Uh, first, the early post-infarct pericarditis, which is seen in the first few days after a myocardial infarction, and a phenomena of condition called Dressler syndrome, which occurs several weeks following a myocardial infarction. The clinical features that will help you to identify a patient in, uh, with pericarditis, typically you'll get a history of a patient who presents with pleuritic chest pain, worsening with deep inspiration, that's also alleviated by leaning forward and worsened when the patient lies flat. On physical exam, you'll hear a characteristic uh, friction rub caused by stretching of the inflamed pericardium. And here's an example of what that might sound like. If you listen closely, uh, you'll notice that it contains two components, uh, both during systole and diastole. The diastolic component uh, can further be broken down into two sounds, one that occurs during early diastolic filling, uh, corresponding to the E wave on mitral inflow, and a late diastolic filling corresponding to the A wave during atrial contraction. A common tool that clinicians use to diagnose pericarditis is the ECG. Uh, the classic findings uh, are due to inflammation of the myocardium, uh, due to the nearby inflammation of the pericardium. And classically, these findings include uh, starting with uh, diffuse PR depressions and ST elevations, uh, followed by normalization of the PR and ST segments, and then finally, uh, diffuse T-wave inversions. Uh, 
Rarely you might see downsloping of the TP segment, which is termed the spodic sign. One diagnostic challenge is to distinguish the ST elevations of pericarditis from similar mild ST elevations uh, that are seen diffusely in a condition called early repolarization, which is a benign phenomenon generally uh, seen in younger patients. A couple of helpful distinguishing features on the ECG to uh, help distinguish between these two phenomena are the ST uh, elevation to T wave amplitude ratio. So if the ST elevation uh, from the TP segment to the J point is greater than a quarter of the height of the T wave, that's more suggestive of pericarditis rather than early repolarization. Isolated uh, elevations at the J point or J waves are also more classically found in early repolarization rather than pericarditis. And it's important to note that since these ECG changes in pericarditis are associated with inflammation, uh, causes of pericarditis that are not due to inflammation, such as uremic pericarditis and forms of idiopathic pericarditis will not usually have these changes. Here's a sample ECG of a patient with pericarditis. Uh, it was uh, taken from a young 32-year-old male. And you'll notice that there's very slight ST elevations all over the place. Um, you can probably easily see them in V3, V4, V5, and V6 but they're also present in, uh, to a lesser extent, in 2, 3, and AVF. Together with these changes, you'll notice that the PR segment is lower than the TP segment in most of the leads. You can see here in t lead 2, lead 1, lead V6, V5, V4. A few features about um, this particular pattern is that the ST elevations are concave up. As you can see, the shape of them is sort of U-shaped. This is in contrast to the typical concave down appearance of pathologic ST elevations associated with uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. And the T waves in the leads with positive QRS complexes are all upright. So in pericarditis, you usually don't see T wave inversions at the same time as the ST elevations and PR depressions. Another diagnostic challenge um, in the other direction, so um, missing a more serious diagnosis, is a common pitfall. In particular, uh, clinicians who are attempting to diagnose pericarditis may miss a true STEMI. And particularly if you're in doubt about the nature of the patient's chest pain, if they're not reporting any particular risk factors or precipitating events such as a recent viral infection or uremia that might be causing their uh, potential pericarditis, it's very, very important to make sure to rule out ischemic heart disease in these patients. So you uh, with any patient who has suspected pericarditis, you'll likely be doing serial ECGs and troponins in order to uh, look for concerning findings, which would include the appearance of Q waves, which are not usually seen in uh, pericarditis alone, reciprocal changes, such as ST elevations in the lateral leads with ST depressions in the inferior leads, again, not typically seen in pericarditis, and the pattern with uh, disappearance of S waves or a marked increase in the J point elevation greater than 50% of the R wave amplitude in the precordial leads, uh, that would be concerning for ischemic heart disease. Uh, this latter phenomenon is termed the terminal QRS distortion or TQRSD. So again, an ECG showing any of these phenomena should be treated more as uh, an ischemic picture rather than pericarditis. The troponins will help uh, 
it's possible to have pericarditis with direct involvement of the myocardium, in which case it's termed myopericarditis. This is a entity that's very difficult to distinguish from a true myocardial infarction, since it will also be associated with uh, wall motion abnormalities on echocardiography. And many of these patients are eventually taken for cardiac catheterization to rule out coronary disease. Elevations in inflammatory markers such as ESR and CRP are useful in identifying inflammatory processes that can be contributing to the patient's pericarditis. And if no clear cause of the patient's pericarditis is present uh, and you're not suspecting coronary disease or ischemic heart disease, uh, you should consider evaluation for rheumatologic diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or rheumatic fever, uh, do a basic malignancy evaluation and check for tuberculosis. Most patients with uh, suspected or likely pericarditis will also get a transthoracic echocardiogram to look for pericardial effusions, wall motion abnormalities, and other complications uh, that would warrant a further investigation, particularly patients who might need a cardiac catheterization. When managing patients with a suspected pericarditis, you should consider whether they warrant inpatient admission for their symptoms. Patients who present with fever, uh, who are immunosuppressed, who had a recent history of trauma, who are on anticoagulation, uh, who've had recurrent episodes of pericarditis, or who have any complications such as uh, tamponade or large effusions that we'll discuss later, do require admission for further evaluation and monitoring. Uh, Other patients with uncomplicated pericarditis can often be managed as an outpatient or with brief period of inpatient observation followed by discharge. The most important part of treating pericarditis is to identify and treat the underlying cause, which could be uh, dialysis for uremia, giving antibiotics for fungal or bacterial pericarditis, and treatment of the underlying malignancy. Patients with either idiopathic forms of pericarditis or uh, other Simple inflammatory causes of pericarditis without uh, other definitive treatment, such as viral pericarditis and uh, rheumatologic pericarditis, are typically treated with a course of anti-inflammatory medications. These include a high dose of NSAIDs, which uh, could, for example, be ibuprofen 800 milligrams every six hours for a month. Patients who have pericarditis, particularly secondary to uh, early post-infarct inflammation, are better treated with aspirin rather than other NSAIDs, uh, such as aspirin, 800 milligrams every six hours for a month. Patients who are not good candidates for uh, NSAID or aspirin use and or have been refractory to those therapies can be considered to start on prednisone. Uh, But prednisone alone is a first-line therapy Uh, is thought to be associated with increased risk of recurrence. In addition to these, patients who don't have any significant contraindication should also be started on colchicine, which is a microtubule inhibitor that limits the amount of acute inflammation that occurs in the tissues by inhibiting neutrophils. It's usually given as an extended therapy over three months to help prevent recurrent episodes of pericarditis. Now, beyond simple pericarditis, we have an entity called constrictive pericarditis. This is when uh, repeated or severe inflammation of the pericardium causes fibrosis and calcification of the normally distensible and compliant pericardium, leading to a significant impairment in diastolic filling. Now, any cause of pericarditis can also lead to constriction, but infections such as TB, and radiation are particularly uh, associated with causing constrictive uh, pathology. So when does a pericardial process cause constriction? When can we uh, label it as constrictive? Uh, 
The basic idea is that any constrictive process is something that limits the total volume of the heart in both the left and right ventricles and atria combined. So then if the total volume of the heart is fixed, then any increase in right-sided filling during diastole would be compensated for by a decrease in left-sided filling during diastole. And this phenomenon where the any increase in the right ventricular filling would lead to a decrease in the left ventricular filling and vice versa is called ventricular interdependence. And that's a classic feature of constrictive uh, per, uh, pericardial pathology, which we'll see uh, is found both in constrictive pericarditis and cardiac tamponade. Another key feature of constriction is that early diastolic filling is relatively unimpaired um, and potentially even exaggerated as a result of elevated uh, right atrial pressures, which will help passively push blood from the right atrium into the right ventricle. But eventually, the stretching of the right ventricle reaches a limit uh, where the compliance of the pericardium becomes a limiting factor. And at that point, filling is significantly impaired uh, in late diastole, leading to a sharp rise in late diastolic pressures. In this diagram, we'll, we see a very simple uh, depiction of ventricular interdependence. So you see um, both in inspiration and expiration, the total volume of the heart is fixed as a result of the uh, non-compliant pericardium surrounding the heart. During inspiration, increased venous return to the right side of the heart causes increased filling of the right ventricle but because the total volume of the heart is fixed, the left ventricular volume must necessarily decrease. And you'll see that by a deviation of the interventricular septum in towards the left ventricle. In early expiration, the opposite occurs. There's decreased right ventricular filling, but increased left ventricular filling. And uh, since, again, the total volume of the heart is fixed, that leads to a uh, decrease in the right-sided filling um, associated with a deviation of the ventricular septum towards the right ventricle. This phenomenon can be seen very clearly if a patient were to undergo a right and left heart catheterization simultaneously, and the pressures in the left ventricle and the right ventricle were recorded simultaneously. So here we see that in expiration, the left ventricle is filling more than the right ventricle. So the pressure in the left ventricle is relatively high. The pressure in the right ventricle is relatively low. During an inspiration, the uh, left ventricular filling is impaired as a result of increased right ventricular filling. And that manifests as decreased, relative decrease in the left ventricular filling and uh, relative increase in the right ventricular filling. So the fact that the left ventricular pressures decrease and the right ventricular pressures increase during inspiration is a reflection of ventricular interdependence. Also seen in these curves is the phenomenon where in early diastole, there's a dramatic increase in uh, filling of both ventricles. So a sharp dip in the pressures in early diastole, followed by an abrupt rise and plateau, which is seen when the uh, compliance limit of the pericardium is reached and it can't stretch anymore to accommodate more filling. So this appearance of a dip followed by a plateau resembles the square root sign, and um, that's what it's called. It's a uh, characteristic not only of constrictive pericarditis, but also of restrictive processes. And therefore, uh, the differentiation between constriction and restriction presents a diagnostic challenge. So let's go into that. So restrictive cardiomyopathies are conditions where there's an abnormal stiffening of the ventricular walls, and it can be caused by a number of conditions such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 
eosinophilic or amyloid or sarcoid in infiltration of the cardiac walls, and certain glycogen storage diseases such as Fabry's disease, which all impair diastolic filling. And constrictive processes, which would include constrictive pericarditis and cardiac tamponade, are primarily disorders of the pericardium rather than the myocardium, and it forms a non-compliant barrier around the heart, which also impairs diastolic filling. So because uh, diastolic filling is impaired in both of these conditions, uh, they produce a, a heart failure, a generally heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. However, we do have a number of tools uh, to help distinguish between these two phenomena because they are treated very differently. Uh, and those include looking at uh, venous pressure waveforms, looking, at, looking for the phenomenon of ventricular interdependence, which is very specific for constriction, and to look at uh, tissue velocities of the myocardium. To make things simple, uh, think of restriction as an issue with the heart relaxing in all directions, since the entire, mar entire myocardium is affected, uh, with the septum basically locked into a fixed position. Whereas in constriction, the heart only has trouble relaxing outward uh, in the direction of the pericardium, while motion in the other directions is essentially unimpaired. And the septum is free to move around uh, which contributes to the ventricular in interdependence. Whereas in restriction, uh, there isn't ventricular interdependence because the septum is fixed. Here we see a distinction between a patient with um, impaired relaxation as a result of their cardiomyopathy. Uh, the ventricular walls have difficulty relaxing and stretching out in diastole in all directions, both outward and relaxing in this uh, apical to basal direction. This manifests in a tissue Doppler echocardiography as a small E prime wave, which specifically measures the uh, mitral annular relaxation velocity. In contrast, in constrictive pericarditis, the ventricular walls have difficulty relaxing outward as a result of the decreased compliance of the pericardium, but there's no difficulty in relaxing in the apical to basal direction since the muscles themselves are not affected. This manifests as a high E prime velocity on tissue Doppler. Notice also in this picture how the interventricular septum is relatively midline and fixed in um, impaired relaxation cardiomyopathy, whereas it can bulge and deviate to one ventricle or the other during the respiratory cycle uh, in constrictive pericarditis. And here are again two graphs showing uh, right and left heart pressure tracings taken simultaneously in two different patients. See that on the right is the picture we saw before where during expiration um, compared to inspiration, the left ventricular pressures are higher, whereas the right ventricular pressures are lower. Um, so there's a discrepancy, a uh, discordance between the increase in the pressure in the left ventricle uh, compared to a decrease in pressure in the right ventricle. That's interventricular, uh, ventricular interdependence. That phenomenon is not seen on the graph on the right, where during inspiration, both the pressures in the left ventricle and the right ventricle fall together. So the, uh, however, both of these patients do demonstrate the square root sign with the sharp dip in the early diastolic filling followed by a plateau. Sharp dip, followed by a plateau. This indicates that both patients have elevated uh, diastolic early filling pressures, which contributes to the sh early sharp dip, but do have impaired late diastolic filling. However, the patient on the left, due to the lack of ventricular interdependence, uh, 
likely has a restrictive cardiomyopathy, whereas the patient on the right with the phenomenon of ventricular interdependence likely has constriction. While diagnosing constrictive pericarditis may present many diagnostic challenges, the management is relatively straightforward. Uh, the definitive treatment is a pericardiectomy, uh, which is shown in the diagram here. The uh, does involve open heart surgery, where the surgeon uh, carefully dissects away the uh, diseased pericardium and carefully separates it from the myocardium. This uh, takes away the diastolic filling barrier and allows the heart to resume its normal hemodynamics. Another common pericardial condition is the pericardial effusion. This is dis um, characterized by an excess buildup of fluid between the visceral and parietal pericardium. And the reasons for this fluid can include any of the causes of pericarditis we discussed previously, as the inflammation or other process can uh, lead to the accumulation of serous fluid. But other causes can include renal failure and hemopericardium, where it's actually blood that fills up that space as a result of either trauma, uh, free wall rupture after an MI, or aortic dissection. Here's a picture showing a, a transthoracic echocardiogram with a subcostal four-chamber view of the heart. The right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle are labeled in the picture. But around the heart, uh, between the visceral and parietal pericardium, is a large anechoic area, which appears black on ultrasound. Uh, that's typically fluid or blood, similar to what's filling the inner chambers of the ventricles and atria. And this is the most common way to definitively diagnose a pericardial effusion. Now, although the size of the pericardial effusion might seem significant, as in the previous picture, that doesn't always translate into severe clinical symptoms or hemodynamic uh, instability. Uh, not only is the amount of fluid important, it's also a lot about how quickly that fluid accumulated. So uh, clinical symptoms of any effusion are dependent on both the volume present um, and the rate of accumulation. Slowly progressing effusions can accumulate even up to two liters of fluid or blood inside the pericardium without causing any symptoms or evidence of hemodynamic compromise. Whereas even 100 mLs of fluid or blood can cause significant hemodynamic compromisers and symptoms uh, if they develop acutely. So what are some clinical clues that might point us in the direction of a patient having a significant pericardial effusion? Well, one is the ECG. So here's an example of an ECG from a patient with a very large pericardial effusion. Uh, the most important thing you'll notice about this is that the QRS morphologies seem to be uh, different and alternating from beat to beat. So uh, looking in V5, we see a positive QRS followed by a predominantly negative QRS, then back to the same positive QRS, negative QRS, positive QRS in a regularly alternating pattern. Although a similar pattern is seen in ventricular bigeminy, where a PVC alternates with a sinus beat, um, the QRSs in this case are both narrow complex, which uh, makes it unlikely that either is coming from the ventricles. Instead, the sudden shift in axis is caused by the heart swinging around inside of the pericardial effusion so that the direction of the main electrical vector of depolarization is alternating from beat to beat. This is, the phenomenon is called electrical alternance. On chest x-rays, uh, we see this pattern, traditionally with very large pericardial effusions. Uh, you see what looks like significant cardiomegaly, where the cardiac silhouette is significantly larger than half of the uh, 
diameter of the chest wall. But unlike cardiomegaly associated with uh, LVH or uh, systolic heart failure, this is fairly symmetric and particularly predominant at the bases. So you see a bulge on the right and a similar bulge on the left. This pattern is usually called the water bottle sign because it looks like this old leather flask water bottle which stretches out at the bottom as it's filled with water. The most severe forms of pericardi uh, pericardial effusions are associated with a physiologic phenomenon called tamponade, which occurs when the effusion actually impairs hemodynamics of the patient and leads to significant symptoms. Whenever the effusion is enough to cause hemodynamic compromise, uh, eventually leading to uh, obstructive shock, we can say the patient is in, is in tamponade. The clinical findings associated with cardiac tamponade are pulses paradoxus and the so-called Bex triad, consisting of hypotension, JVD, and muffled heart sounds, although all three of these findings are not often seen together in patients with tamponade. Some of the hemodynamic features that we can identify in these patients will include impaired diastolic filling with uh, the finding of ventricular interdependence, which we discussed before, equalization of the right and left filling pressures, and attenuated wide descent on a venous pressure tracing. So let's go into some of these findings and how they occur and how they look. And pulses paradoxus is essentially the clinical correlate of ventricular interdependence. Uh, it's caused both by that phenomenon and a relative increase in the left ventricular afterload during inspiration, which prevents uh, the left ventricle from ejecting as much blood out into the aorta during inspiration compared to expiration. What you're looking for is a drop in the patient's systolic blood pressure by uh, 20 millimeters of mercury or more, or in their diastolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury or more with inspiration compared to expiration. Historically, we would assess this using a manual blood pressure measurement, uh, where we would slowly lower the patient's uh, blood pressure cuff uh, pressure uh, while listening carefully for the uh, appearance and the disappearance of Karotkov sounds associated with the inspiratory cycle. In particular, the uh, first Karotkov sound would appear during expiration, then seem to disappear when the patient uh, takes a breath in, and then reappear once the patient uh, goes into expiration again. We'll note that a similar pattern will be seen in patients who will present with severe asthma as a result of exaggerated respiratory variation in their hemodynamics as a result of their uh, labored uh, respir respirations. Although we used to use manual blood pressure cuff measurements to assess pulses paradoxes, uh, now in many patients, especially who have invasive blood pressure monitoring with arterial lines, uh, we can see pulses paradoxes directly on a monitor. Uh, here's a, an example of such a monitor taken from a patient with tamponade. Uh, the physician in this case recorded the bl patient's blood pressure continuously with an arterial line and at the same time recorded the phase of respirations. You'll see that during inspiration, the patient's blood pressure, uh, peak systolic pressure was fairly high. And then during an expiration, the peak systolic pressure dropped. The measured difference between inspiratory systolic pressure and expiratory systolic pressure was found to be 25, which would meet the criteria for pulses paradoxes. More commonly, when tamponade physiology is suspected, uh, clinicians will perform a bedside transthoracic echocardiogram to look for several uh, defining features. 
Here's an image from a patient uh, taken in the apical four chamber view of the heart. The uh, right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, and left ventricle are labeled. In addition to a, again, a large anechoic space around the heart, which is the pericardial effusion. A simultaneous ECG recording is provided at the bottom of this picture. Uh, and this arrow indicates that the patient is currently in diastole uh, since the point is occurring just after the T wave and before the following QRS complex. And in diastole, we see this red arrow pointing towards the collapse of the right ventricle. So a collapsing inward of the right ventricular free wall as a result of the external pressure created by this very large pericardial effusion. And so right-sided diastolic collapse is one of the easiest uh, findings to look for to identify a patient who might have tamponade physiology. Uh, right atrial collapse, diastolic collapse, is a more sensitive finding, whereas right ventricular diastolic collapse is more specific. In addition, we can directly assess for ventricular interdependence using echocardiography. In this case, we're looking at a pulse wave Doppler signal through the mitral valve in the uh, apical four chamber view of the heart. The signal we get is a graph of flow through the mitral valve over time. And these two sets of repeating peaks represent diastolic filling of the left ventricle from the left atrium. Um, they represent early diastolic filling, um, that's the E wave, and late diastolic filling caused by atrial contraction which is the A wave. As a result of ventricular interdependence, during inspiration, the left, ventricular, left ventricle has impaired filling, and so the mitral inflow signal is smaller in inspiration compared to expiration. One of the echocardiographic criteria for tamponade physiology is that the uh, peak mitral inflow of the E wave during inspiration is 25% or more less than the uh, peak velocity of mitral inflow during expiration. The opposite phenomenon would be seen if the same uh, technique was used at the tricuspid valve on the right side of the heart, whereas in this case, the inspiratory signal through the tricuspid valve would be higher than the expiratory signal through the same valve. And the cutoff uh, for that is usually a 15% change on the right side. For patients who are hooked up to a continuous central venous pressure monitor, uh, there's also another finding that we can look for to assess for tamponade physiology. The Y descent of the central venous pressure tracing in a normal patient occurs as a result of tricuspid valve opening and blood flowing from the right atrium into the right ventricle, which decreases right atrial pressures. In constrictive pericarditis, there's er rapid early filling, uh, which leads to a steep wide ascent, uh, followed by impaired late filling, uh, diastolic filling, once the pericardium reaches its limit of stretch. Whereas in tamponade, right ventricular diastolic filling uh, is accompanied by fluid shifts of the uh, pericardial effusion, uh, which transmits pressures back into the right atrium and attenuates that wide ascent. So here we see the normal central venous pressure tracing. We have an A wave caused by atrial contraction, leading to increased pressures in the, um, in the atrium and the central veins. Usually, shortly after that, there is a C wave corresponding to the increase in pressure from uh, ventricular contraction. After that, as the ventricle relaxes, you have an X descent. Diastolic filling is accompanied by a gradual increase in pressure uh, called a V wave. And then once the tricuspid valve opens, 
blood flows out from the right atrium into the right ventricle, creating a wide descent. In tamponade, uh, when blood is ejected from the right ventricle during uh, systole, uh, a normal X descent is still produced. And ventricular uh, and venous return into the right atrium causes a normal V wave. But when the tricuspid valve opens and blood starts to flow from the right atrium into the right ventricle, uh, the fluid around the heart, which is incompressible, uh, gets pushed upward from the right ventricular area up towards the right atrium. This increases the pressure in the right atrium and attenuates the wide descent that should normally occur. In constrictive pericarditis, when the tricuspid valve opens, the high pressures in the right atrium initially lead to rapid filling of the right ventricle. But there's a limit when the pericardium that's thickened and fibrosed becomes stretched to its limit and can't stretch anymore. And at that point, the uh, filling gets significantly impaired. So the initial rapid right ventricular filling in constrictive pericarditis leads to a steep wide descent. Now, many uncomplicated pericardial effusions are managed similar to pericarditis um, as they're often caused by the same underlying etiologies. You first identify and treat the most likely contributing factor and prescribe anti-inflammatory medications as needed to treat um, inflammatory causes. For patients with large pericardial effusions, treatment options include pericardiocentesis, the surgical creation of a pericardial window with a pericardiostomy. Tamponade uh, is a medical emergency, uh, also potentially a surgical emergency. Uh, these patients are usually initially stabilized with IV fluids and inotropes uh, but they do need require emergent pericardial synthesis or a pericardial window as soon as possible. Pericardial synthesis uh, traditionally uses the following method. Uh, you would locate this patient's xiphoid process, then take a needle with a syringe, uh, angle it at 45 degrees, uh, point it towards the patient's left shoulder, and then advance the needle several centimeters uh, while pulling back creating negative pressure until fluid or blood is aspirated from the pericardium. Commonly, this is done under ultrasound guidance in order to avoid complications and misplacement of the needle. Some of the dreaded complications of pericardiosynthesis would include inadvertent puncture of the left ventricle, uh, inadvertent puncture of the LAD, or another coronary artery, pneumothorax, and bowel perforation. In patients where pericardial synthesis is performed for an uncomplicated pericardial effusion without tamponade, uh, a mistake in needle placement or inadvertent puncture can actually lead to tamponade. And finally, definitive management would include the surgical creation of a pericardial window. This is essentially a surgery to create an opening in the pericardial sac, which then allows fluid or blood to drain out into the chest, peritoneum, or an external drain that's placed in the patient. Here's an image of a patient undergoing a pericardial window where a sternotomy is performed, the pericardium is uh, folded back, and an opening is created where fluid can drain out. And that concludes this lecture on pericardial diseases. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much and have a great day.